So, um, this is the shortest sermon I've ever preached. Just kidding. But it's a good sermon. I practiced it to myself the other day. So, Prince of Peace, th this morning I went to the jail and I passed out their Christmas gifts because I'm allowed to give them candy bars. And the uh, funniest thing that happened this morning, I went to the cells and I, I went in and said, Merry Christmas! And, and of course they were still sleeping. And, and I got them all up out of bed and they all looked pr pretty groggy. And um, I gave them, they were all excited because they get excited about chocolate. And, and, uh, and they says, thank you. And, and I got through all the cells and, and one of them says, it's not Christmas. I says, it's Christmas today. <laughs> and, and then the cell next to this guy, because the guy wasn't behaving, so he didn't get a candy bar. So um, the other one says, I'll take his candy bar <laughs> from the other cell. And the guy says, I'm Jewish, so I should get more candy. And I says, and I opened his little cell door because there's a little window. And I says, if you're Jewish, you don't eat candy. He goes, I'm not Jewish, I'm atheist. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, <laughs> you only get one. <laughs> so it was really funny. I, I just laughed. And then I went to another cell, I opened the door, and he got out of bed, and he says, well, Merry Christmas, Tim, I appreciate it. And I says, aren't you glad I didn't sing to you? And the jailer goes, man, I would like to see that. And I says, no, you wouldn't have. So it was a great time this morning. That was how I started out my morning, is to meet the inmates this morning, because um, some of them are waiting to go to DOC, so please keep them in prayer. So... Isaiah 9, 6 is where we're going to start this. I have several passages of scriptures to start this out before I start the points. There's only three points. Um, Isaiah 9, 6 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Interesting statement is Prince of Peace. If you look into the Hebrew language, you'll find out it interesting. The Hebrew ancient language actually breaks this word Prince of Peace into two words. The word Sar and Shalom. The word Sar, the one is, is in charge, Lord, Chief, or General. But Shalom is rest, tranquility, wholeness, completeness, and contentment. Just wanted to give that out to you so that you get where we're going with this. Remember, I've been talking about peace for three weeks on this. So John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, and I do not give to you as the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This last week we've seen a world and a country, as Don mentioned, a world that has been peaceless. Yep. Yeah. And we need to understand that our world and our world, our life is not defined by this world. Right. Yeah. Let me just say that because you're not that excited about it. Yeah. Our world, us, is not defined by this world. Amen. Our lives is not been defined by what's going around here. Our world is defined by our relationship with Jesus Christ and that's where our peace comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? So please do not be begin to pray for our country, but that does not define who we are. We are defined by our relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. We should be praying for our country. We should be praying for our government. We should be praying for our president, but that does not define who we are. We are Christians. We are supposed to be Christ-like. We should be praying. We should be serving our Christ. That's where our peace comes from. Amen. All right. Romans 5.1. Therefore, see, and I'm not a politician or a po even in politics. In fact, one time I had to ask who I was supposed to vote for, who, whether I was Republican or Democrat, because I didn't even know. I had to ask my wife once. I used to flip a coin when I was 18, my first time I ever voted. I walked into the, the box. You remember the little chats? Just an honest truth. <laughs> I used to take the Iowa basic t test, drawing pictures. Oh my 
And I walked in there, first time I ever voted, this is the truth, side note, this is called a buddy trail. I didn't know what I was, besides a human being, and someone questioned that too. And I walked in there, and I did any, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by the toe, if I should die, you know, you know. And that's how I voted. Because I didn't know how to vote. Nobody ever told me. And so then I got married to my wife. Who blessed me? Yep. Who set me straight? Glory to God. All right, let's get back into the sermon. Let's get spiritual. Romans 5 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, man. Psalms 4 8. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone make me dwell in safety. Yeah. Psalms 29, 11 says this, The Lord gives strength, strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Yeah. Do you see where we're going with this? Yeah. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, and have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. In our studies, we did, in our study on Wednesday night, we realized and have found out that this was a great wall that has broken between Jews and Gentiles. We are one. Yes. And Christ died for Everybody. So there is no reason that we should be fighting amongst people. We should say, God died for you. God died for me. Jesus died for everyone. Amen? Amen. It is impossible for you to have peace without connecting authentically in a relationship with Jesus. Carrie and I had a great conversation coming home from the restaurant last night that the the millennial generation is looking for an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. That's true. Yeah. See, we live in a world, you adults have been in the church forever, and you like it when you get challenged, but not challenged too harshly. <laughs> but the millennials, they want to be challenged. They want to be <laughs> challenged. Yeah. I love that Brother Yancey got in front of the whole uh Youth Convention says, I want you to give everything that you have in your wallet to missions. I challenge you. I double dog dare you challenge. And you know what? They got the biggest offering they ever had. $20,000. And you know what? That's what our kids want. But see, they want to have an authentic relationship. They want to be challenged. They want to be encouraged. They want to see something real. But here's the problem. What we have today is those that have been in the church forever, you don't really want that. Because if, if someone challenges you like that, you get mad. You get angry because that's none of your business. Don't challenge me like that. You're pushing or you're stepping on my toes way too much. Maybe I'm talking out of the wrong side of my mouth and saying, you don't know us like that. We want that kind of stuff. But most churches today, people walk out the door when they're challenged like that. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. I'm just saying, this is what statistics say. This is why churches are dying. This is because people can't handle being challenged like that. I'm saying today, the church needs to rise up and experience the challenge that God has for us. Next year is 2020, the year of vision for our church. And God wants to challenge us to go even further beyond. And if that means we need to get up and get busy, let's get up and get busy. If we need to be challenged by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's get challenged by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we need to understand, oh, the first one you're going to really love. Um, if we need to understand what God has for us and really get busy and get challenged a little bit, he's going to challenge me and challenge all of us. Can we handle it? Can we handle once in a while having someone say, I need a spiritual spanking? 
I know sometimes that hurts and sometimes it ha- I don't like it. But it's true. Sometimes we as a church needs that to experience the fullness of God's peace. That's right. Amen, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about activating the keys, the keys to activating his peace in your own life. We want to have peace in our own life. So how do we do that? Number one, we need to get under the lordship of Jesus. We need to get under under his lordship. We need to have him as king. We, so many times in today's society, everyone wants to go, no, I'm in charge, right? I'm in charge. I'm king of this castle. No, he's the king. Right. Yeah. He's the Lord. Yeah. So we as Christians, we don't have to be in control. God is in control. We need to get under his lordship. We need to follow his direction. We need to follow his guidance. Either he's God of all or not at all. In Acts 10, 36, it says, You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. Oh, let me read that to you again because that's so good. That's preachable right there. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel. Announcing. The billboard has been plastered. The good news of peace through Jesus Christ. Who is the Lord of all? Isaiah 32, 17 and 18 says the fruits of the righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. Oh, hallelujah. We need that. But until we understand to put God at the kingship, at the lordship of our homes, at the lordship of our country, at the lordship of our cities, at the lordship of our lives, we will never understand the completeness of his peace. Activating his peace in our own life. Number two, we need to bring Jesus into every situation. In every, everyone say every. So you get that in your spirit because we try to pick and choose where can God meet or where can he be or where can he not be. You know, every situation, every situation, he fits into every situation. Wherever you're at, whatever decision you're made, he's there. Yeah. You know, he's omnipresent. You can't get away from him. You can't hide from him. He's there. Yeah. He's there with you. Every, if you are a believer in Christ, he's there. Yeah. If you show up at the grocery store, he's there. If you sneak into the bar, he's there. If you sit, sneak into the porno shop, he's there. What? Nobody ever does that. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Come on. He knows when you're good. He knows when you're bad. He knows what you're up to, so don't think you're going to get away with it. My mama has a mama intuition. But Jesus has a Jesus intuition because he knows what you're up to. So don't think you can get away with it. (laughs) Because he's omnipresent. Did you hear me? He's, He's everywhere. You know when you got a spanking by your mama or your daddy, that hurt. But a spiritual spanking by your heavenly father it hurts right here. Yes. Second Thessalonians 3.16 says this. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you the peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you. Mm-hmm. All of you. Mm-hmm. Philippians 4, 8 and 9 says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. 
And, and anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received, have heard from me or seen in me, put into, my, into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Yeah. So next time you think, whatever, think about this verse. It's whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Put into practice. You know these things. And next time you think about it and you feel guilty about something, think about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's actually at work. Yeah. Yes. He's there. The last key before we take communion. Keep your mind on Jesus. Keep your mind on Jesus. Isaiah 26.3 says this. You'll keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on. You because he trusts in you. Keep your mind stayed on. Oh, come on. Laser focus. One time I went for a, a ride along with Eric Smith. It was probably my first time, and he, night goggles, right? Those are cool. Anybody ever use them? They're the coolest. All the officers have these cool toys. So I'm out there with Eric, and we're having a great conversation. We're riding around, and he goes, Tim, check these out. I says, check what out? It's dark out. You can't look through these things. He goes, no, turn them on. And all of a sudden, we seen deer. I went, those are cool. <laughs> and then we went through another place. He says, we're, we need to look over there, because we're there was someone running through the woods or we're looking for someone running through the woods. And I'm like, he says, look. And there was nobody there, but I thought, this is pretty cool. I'm thinking laser focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, we need to have that kind of laser focus on God. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. yeah. Every single time in our life, keep your mind focused on Jesus. Romans 15, 13 say, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope yes. by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To have peace. You've got to know the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Y'all are in a spirit-filled church. Yes. <laughs> Wednesday... I was in, in church and, and we were talking we were talking about debauchery drunkenness and we got and we got talking about drugs and all that stuff and you know they know and somehow we got talking about those spirit filled Christians and I said oh yeah I know about those and one of them they all said, you know, we talked about, you know, alcoholics. And we were talking about how, you know, you drink, you drink, you, and then you wake up in the morning and you just kind of see your life in the toilet. And that's how that's... Res and they says, yeah, but there's something about... And this one guy was standing up. He was like, yeah, but those, you know, those spirit-filled Christians, they're like happy all the time. <laughs> or they feel joyful all the time. Or there's something different about them. Amen. And, and, and they says, I like that. And, and we were talking about that, and I just kind of says, that's my church. That's a Pentecostal church. We have the spirit-filled life. But see, here's something wrong. We don't engage that spirit-filled life enough. We have it, but we don't engage it enough. Right? We, we have it. We just don't engage it enough. I mean, we get into worship, but we don't engage it enough. We, we have the ability to turn on a 
great worship time, but we don't engage the, the spirit enough. We, we can walk in the spirit, but we don't even engage that enough. We, we have that power. But we don't plug into it enough. We need that power once again. We need that old Acts 2 and Acts 1-8 Come on. again. Come on. We wait for it. We say, God, do it again. I remember one time I was praying in here. I says, will you do it again, God? Will you? Will you do it? Yes. And we need to be praying, God, okay. you can and one of my biggest prayers for 2020 is, he can. He will. Amen. And my question is, will you will. plug in to what God has for us? Yes. Because it's he's willing, he's able. The other side of the question are, are you willing? And are you able? to plug in to the power that is already available to us that he's already yeah. promised through his word for each one of us yeah. to experience that peace that is overflowing for each one of us that we don't have to walk down trotted and, and drag our keisters <laughs> to church going, oh, I've got to go to church again. No, be excited, full of joy, full of excitement, yeah. going, okay, it's better than a football game, better than something else, better than NASCAR. <laughs> Better than a KU game or a K-State game. Better than anything else. I get to go to church. I get to worship the King of Kings. I get to praise the Lord at all times. And God's going to do something because I believe it because I come anticipating. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. Because he is able and he's willing. And if you're able and you're willing, watch when those things come together Amen. and the power begins to ignite. Yes. And that has nothing to do with my sermon, but has everything to do with us. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? Woo! I don't even know where to go from here, but it works. Except with this. Romans 15, 13. I'm going to read it to you again. As we prepare to sing the last song. And we prepare to get ready for communion. Just want to encourage as we get ready for communion. And we get ready to pray for families. We're going to, we're going to change to some worship that's going to be played. We're going to sing this last song. If you get ready to hand out those. Would you be ready to pr pray? If you're here singly, would you couple up? And we're just going to pray together. I mean gathers groups I just want to pray over you bless your family and but we're going to do this after the song and when the recorded music plays I'm going to step down here going to read the scripture and then we're going to start praying over families don't rush we're here for you we love you God has a purpose and plan but I'm going to read this passage I'm going to pray and then we're going to worship and then we're going to take communion. Romans 15, 13 says this. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. Let's engage with this. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that as we close this section of the service, may we engage in the power of the Holy Spirit. In your name, amen.